So hello, everyone. My name is Patty Sopis. I'm a librarian at Santa Monica College, and I will be presenting this workshop, News Literacy Strategies for Evaluating News. Uh, in this workshop, we're going to look at definitions, meaning what are we talking about? We'll look at players and mechanics of the news ecosystem, uh, where the readers are in this ecosystem and how to detect and decipher disinformation. So we'll start with the definition. What is news? News is information about recent events deemed to be interesting, important, or unusual enough to be newsworthy, or fresh information about less recent events. Uh, that is gathered, verified, and structured in accordance with journalistic norms before being published in media, ranging from newspapers to live blogs. Uh, what is news literacy? News literacy is the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports, whether they come via print, television, or the internet. Um, let's see here. Why is news important in a democracy? Shared knowledge is required for public discourse about politics and society, and accurate news helps people make informed decisions in a democracy. Uh, social media and search engines have changed our access to shared knowledge in the following ways. Al algorithmic news feeds and search results present different results to each person based on their tracked online behavior. This algorithmic personalization narrows people's exposure to a variety of ideas or perspectives. And this can reduce the amount of accurate and shared knowledge that we have in common in a society. Disinformation erodes trust in media and other news sources. Where do you go to find news? Think about that. Um, people can get news from many sources and whatever your news habits are, you should know the hallmarks of quality journalism. Here are some essential features of quality journalism. I want to point out that when professional journalists make an error, they are expected to retract, correct, and or apologize and professional journalists should correct errors quickly. The Society of Professional Journalists has a code of ethics, and I'm going to take us to that society's website so that we can look at that code of ethics. So this is um, the code of ethics and um, uh, journalism is a profession. And so it is, you know, journalists are guided by ethics. And this is uh, the code that we see here. Seek truth and report it, minimize harm, act independently and be accountable and transparent. And these sections each have um, descriptions of ways to go about doing those and practicing those ethical um, techniques of journalism. Okay. Uh, let me get this to come up. Excuse me one second. Okay. okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, I don't have time to go through that whole document, but you, it, I would suggest taking a look if you're wondering about particular practices that journalists um, can uh, engage in to ensure that they're doing the best they can to meet these um, ethical codes. So All Sides is a media literacy company with a methodology for rating bias of media outlets on a political spectrum from left to right. 
If we define bias as a point of view or perspective, then all news outlets are biased, but this does not mean that the content is false. Uh, the human tendency is to dismiss sources that have a bias different from our own bias, also known as confirmation bias. All sides uses multiple methods to rate media bias, including editorial reviews, blind bias surveys, independent reviews, and third party research. I'm going to show you the All Sides website um, where they show some current news stories from across the political spectrum. Okay, so each day, um, All Sides publishes selected current stories, and then they include um, you know, recent stories uh, below that set of current uh, stories. And they, what they do is they present stories from um, different publications that represent the left, the center, and the right. So I'm going to, I was looking for, here we go. They have this headline roundup, so they have selected stories. And here's one, how new proposed gig worker rules may affect the economy. Um, and they just show uh, the publication in the beginning of the story here. Um, so from the right, Fox Business, from the center, Reuters, and from the left, Associated Press. So I'm going to uh, select this story. And this is uh, in the headline roundup, um, all sides, does a summary with key facts, quotes, context, how the media covered it, very, very brief um, summary here. And then you can get to the actual story um, if you click on the title, it will take you to um, read the full story and you can see um, the various stories that are covered. And so it's very um, informative to look at uh, the same story from different perspectives. Um, and it helps you to understand um, all of the various perspectives out there. And um, it helps you to become more aware of your own um, biases. Um, so just okay. Sorry. I'm having a technical difficulty here, I apologize. Let me just, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, okay. So just because you agree or disagree with something does not mean it is right or wrong or credible news or fake news. This Pew Research Center survey of uh, over 5,000 US adults examines whether members of the public can recognize news as factual, something that's capable of being, of being proved or disproved by objective evidence, or as an opinion that reflects the beliefs and values of whoever expressed it. Uh, the main portion of the study measured the public's ability to distinguish between five factual statements and five opinion statements. The findings reveal that even this basic task presents a challenge the study found that a majority of Americans correctly identified at least three of the five statements in each set, but this result is only a little better than random guesses. Far few Americans got all five correct and roughly a quarter got most or all wrong. Even more revealing is that certain Americans do far better at parsing through this content than others. In addition to political awareness, party identification plays a role in how Americans differentiate between factual and opinion news statements. Both Republicans and Democrats show a propensity to be influenced by which side of the aisle a statement appeals to most. For example, um, members of each political party were more likely to label both factual and opinion statements as factual when they appealed more to their political side. We can evaluate the reliability of each publication separately from its bias. 
This media bias chart is produced by Ad Fontes Media, a public benefit company. It also shows uh, bias from left to right political perspectives, but this chart adds the vertical dimension um, to show a reliability ranking. So on the left here is the, um, the um, added dimension. And this gives a framework for evaluating reliability separately from bias. The y-axis here ranges from fact reporting at the top uh, um, down to contains inaccurate fabricated information at the bottom. We can see AP and Reuters uh, news services positioned at the top center of this chart, indicating their reliability doing fact reporting and their centrist bias. At and near the bottom, um, excuse me. At the bottom, we show, oh, I'm, this, I'm sorry, I was just going to mention that there are a lot of um, publications here that we would recognize um, in this centrist and fact reporting um, area, including you know, CNN. Uh, PBS, uh, BBC, et cetera. Um, so at the bottom, we show TV Veterans Today, which contains misleading information. So this is what we're reading here, contains misleading information. And that means uh, it's hyperpartisan left or kind of right in between hyperpartisan left and skews left. And then on the far right and at the very bottom here is natural news which contains inaccurate fabricated information. They do have an online version of this chart, which allows you to search for publications that you don't see included here. And so if you were to go to um, at Fontes uh, Media and type in interactive media bias chart, you could see that. So I'm um, not gonna take time now, but I think it's, it's an excellent tool for checking a source out initially and then you know going from there. So, so how do media experts define fake news? They define fake news as factually false information delivered in the context of a supposedly true news story that is deliberately designed to deceive readers or viewers. So how has the use of the phrase fake news changed during the internet era? So this slide traces that. Um, so before 2014, the term fake news was used rarely and usually applied to satirical sites. Then in 2014, researcher Craig Silverman noticed websites that looked like news outlets had published entirely made up stories. By 2016, the trend of hoax sites fooling social media users with these whole cloth fabrications had exploded. Uh, Silverman, then a journalist at BuzzFeed, pub published an analysis that found the most viral fake news stories, including a baseless report that Pope Francis had endorsed Donald Trump, were reaching wider audiences on Facebook than real news stories from real news outlets. And starting in 2017 and over the course of Donald Trump's presidency, the term largely shed its original meaning due to Trump's redefinition of the phrase and came to mean instead any news report or outlet that made the president look bad. So scholars have described three ways in which the term fake news is used. It can imply a genre of disinformation online. It can be used by critical political actors as a label to delegitimize news media. And it can also be used to simply dismiss something as negative or false. Uh, and the dis dismissive usages of the term fake news are particularly problematic because they do not leave room for critically evaluating a source or its message, which can lead to gaps in understanding of consequential information. Instead of focusing on the contested phrase fake news, it, it is more nuanced and useful to use the terms misinformation and disinformation. Um, misinformation typically describes falsehoods of fact 
that are spread either purposely or accidentally. And disinformation, on the other hand, always refers to information specifically designed to mislead or deceive consumers to influence their attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. Claire Wardle is a scholar who studies mis- and disinformation. Um, she stopped using the term fake news in 2017 when it became clear that it was being weaponized by politicians around the world as an attack against the media. In her own work, she recommends these nuanced definitions. Uh, she's developed a continuum of seven types of mis- and disinformation. The low to high spectrum characterizes the intent to deceive. Uh, so, for example, satire or parody does not intend to cause harm, but has the potential to fool. Um, and then contrast that with the very top here, uh, fabricated content that is new content that is 100% false, designed to deceive and do harm. So you're getting fake news, um, fake websites, for example, completely um, fake. So, sorry, I'm gonna go back one second. Uh, here we go. So social media platforms such as Facebook have a dramatically different structure than previous media technologies. Content can be relayed among users with no significant third-party filtering, fact-checking, or editorial judgment. An individual user with no track record or reputation can in some cases reach as many re readers as Fox News, CNN, or New York Times. My friend posted it and that's good enough for me. A little under half or 48% of US adults say they get news from social media often or sometimes, a five percentage point decline compared with 2020 according to a Pew Research Center survey conducted July 26th through August 8th, 2021. Social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok are not news publishers. They serve as gateways to news content. Uh, the January 6th, 2021 siege of the Capitol illustrates the intersection between social media, democracy, and news. This Washington Post article from January 4th, 2022, so a year later, describes Facebook's connection to the wide distribution of election disinformation, which led to real world consequences. This chart from the Pew Research Study mentioned previously shows how many Americans get their news from different social media sites. For example, 66% of US adults um, use Facebook and 31% of US adults, <coughs> excuse me, adults regularly get news on Facebook. One finding from the full study was that younger adults ages 18 to 29 are far more likely to regularly get news on both Snapchat and TikTok than other age groups. There are algorithmic, um, news feeds and algorithms at work here in our news feeds. So social media platforms have far more control than you may realize over your news feed. Um, these algorithms, um, which are uh, software, computer software programs, are designed to increase your engagement in the form of likes, shares, and comments. An algorithm will promote disinformation and misinformation as readily as it promotes legitimate news as long as it engages us. So what role does advertising play in this news ecosystem? Social media platforms want you to engage with their platforms to show you as many ads as possible. News sites, whether credible or untrustworthy, are funded in part by ads. Ad brokers, mainly Google and Facebook, want to place ads and advertisers have limited controls over where their ads are shown. We're gonna take a look at this video from Wired Magazine on how fake news works.
At the start of 2016 in a small town called Velas in Macedonia, an 18-year-old high school student discovered that he could make more money than his parents by building fake news sites. To protect his identity, we'll call him Boris. And here's how he did it. He wrote tons of false articles about the US election, most of them salacious. The articles were shared on Facebook, garnering tons of traffic. So much so that Boris's most popular website earned him $16,000 over the course of a few months. That's way higher than the average monthly salary in Macedonia, which is $371. So Boris dropped out of high school and he was not alone. In the final weeks of the election, there were more than 100 political websites registered to Vellis. The most popular stories were pro-Trump, but that's not because Boris and his fake news publishers liked the candidate. They just liked the money. Trump supporters just happened to be more likely to share fake news. Researchers tracked 30 million shares of pro-Trump stories on Facebook in the months before the election. But why were companies advertising on fake news sites? They weren't directly. Those ads were placed by services like Google AdSense or AppNexus, which act as intermediaries between advertisers and small-time publishers like Boris. They negotiate how much ads cost and manage payments from advertisers to publishers. Those ads follow people wherever they go online. Remember when you recently searched for that onesie? Well, that search was tracked and matched with advertisers selling that product. So everywhere you go on the web, a onesie ad follows. Advertisers and these services create blacklists of sites they won't advertise against. But it's hard to keep up. So sometimes they pop up on fake news sites that haven't been discovered yet. While Boris and his friends were making money, fake news became one of the major scandals of the 2016 elections. Many wondered if sites like Boris's even helped Trump win. A joint study by NYU and Stanford University found that it may not have tipped the election as much as one would think. It found that one fake news story would need to be as persuasive as 36 TV commercials to swing a voter. Still, the backlash forced tech giants like Google and Facebook to do something. Facebook is now partnering with fact-checking organizations like Snopes and PolitiFact to flag articles that present deliberately misleading content. Google now cuts off AdSense revenue to sites with spoof domains like NewYorkTimesPolitics.com. But that's still flagging fake news after it's been published and shared. So tech companies like Moat propose combining algorithms with human insight to catch fake news before it spreads. Check that out. So a nonprofit called the Global Disinformation Index, or GDI, has several primers on disinformation work, on how disinformation works in the news ecosystem. Um, this GDI study from December 2021 shows that advertising continues to fund disinformation. The study is titled Ad Funded Climate Change Disinformation, Money, Brands, and Ad Tech. GDI's study estimates that $36.7 million um, dollars will go to 98 climate change disinformation websites on an annual basis. Here is an example of a well-known um, uh, uh, college, John Hopkins University, advertising their master's degree in environmental sciences and policy. Um, here's the uh, advertisement from Johns Hopkins um, on a page that has an article uh, with climate change disinformation. And this uh, panel on the left is explaining the brand and then who this ad was served by, the site from the Federalist and the disinformation, climate change disinformation. So they've circled here that the server the advertiser, um, the broker is Google um, ads. And so this illustrates that major organizations and companies sometimes in, inadvertently fund disinformation. And this is a, a summary of what uh, these ad um, brokers are 
which ad brokers are profiting from climate change disinformation. So we're going to take a look at another video on um, this time on who starts viral misinformation. And so this is just one take on that. And I'm going to show us this short video. Want to know why coronavirus started or what might cure it? Well, search online and you'll find thousands of answers, many of which aren't true. I investigate disinformation for the BBC and I'm often asked who starts these rumours? And who spreads them? Well, as always, the answer isn't straightforward. So I've broken them down into five different types. One, the Joker. Lots of people have been sharing funny posts and memes online. And some of them are pretty good, but others go too far and people actually believe that they're true. Two, the scammer. This lot are looking to make money from the pandemic. Some create fake texts trying to get hold of your bank account details. Or others plug dodgy advice looking to sell their remedies and cures. Three, the politician. The people in charge can also spread fake news. That includes officials and state-sponsored media from around the world. Officials in China and the US have been trading misinformation since the start of the virus, each accusing the other of deliberately creating it. Of course, neither of those claims are true. And there are concerns about foreign interference. That's when states spread misleading information abroad in order to further their own aims. But it can be very difficult to trace interference back to the people in charge, or to figure out who are behind networks of fake accounts that are pushing misleading information. Four, the conspiracy theorist. These people think that nothing is as it seems. They've falsely linked 5G to coronavirus, speculated about who created it, or even suggested that coronavirus doesn't exist at all. None of these are true. These ideas have been bouncing around on the internet for a while, but they've started getting more attention as worried people look for quick answers to their questions. Five, the insider. There's information that apparently comes from someone you'd trust, an unnamed doctor, professor, or hospital worker. But it turns out they don't exist, or if they do, it seems to be a game of Chinese whispers gone wrong. And this misinformation goes viral because it's shared, often by a relative in your WhatsApp group who passes it on just in case, or by a celebrity who amplifies it to their thousands of followers. Tech companies, media regulators and governments decide what happens when people start and spread misinformation. But ultimately, we're all responsible for stopping its spread. Check out our top tips for spotting and stopping misleading stuff online. And think before you share. Better can start today with a better online education. So, uh, why do we believe and share disinformation? Disinformation often appeals to our emotions. Consider your reactions. People are more likely to share something that makes them angry or happy. One thing we can do is step back, take a breath, and try to reconnect with our reasoning, because this will often be enough to make us think twice about sharing disinformation. Another thing that happens is that disinformation sometimes has a patina of credibility. It seems there's a kernel of truth and it just seems somehow plausible to us. This is particularly a risk when media is presented with an incorrect context or caption. Uh, fake media accounts, so, excuse me, fake social media accounts can be run by computer programs called bots, which are used to trick news um, feed algorithms into believing that someone or some item is popular by creating fake shares, likes, or comments. When we see that something has had a lot of engagement, we may be enticed to join the crowd. The illusory truth effect um, is the effect that, more than, that the more we encounter something, the more we believe it. And that leads to the possibility that every time a lie is repeated, it appears slightly more plausible. And finally, we have confirmation bias so that when information confirms our view, we tend to believe it. 
these are some of the mechanisms of disinformation at work. So information affects us and we affect it. Um, in this comic, um, the person is doing their own research, but they stop when they find the first result that agrees with what they already believe. This is our confirmation bias at work. Another concern is filter bubbles. This occurs when algorithms reflect our choices online back into what we see on the internet. So algorithms and our confirmation bias work together to create this filter bubble of information that we are exposed to. And we might have every intention of seeking out other points of view, um, but the reality is that there's so much information thrown at us that we are tempted to take shortcuts and just not, and just become um, information avoiders because it's just so overwhelming. And that's just, that happens um, all the time. So I'm gonna show you now um, a way, there's a technique that is um, been widely used and is really useful. And if you come across a website in your news feed or in your own searching, a good first step is to find out about the credibility of an author, organization, or website. Um, so, and see what other um, people on the internet are saying about them rather than, you know, spending a lot of time on that page and trying to um, evaluate, evaluate it yourself. Um, go to other sources and get some consensus about that site and about the authors or creators of the site. So we're going to watch another short video. How are you taught to evaluate the credibility of online sources? Everyone knows that information on the web may be shallow, incomplete, inaccurate, or heavily biased, and many of us have been taught to explore the features of a website to assess its credibility. You may have learned to ask, is this site a .com or a .org? Does the site incorporate advertisements? Was it written by someone who appears to have appropriate expertise? Are there citations to supporting evidence or research? Is the information current? While sometimes useful, these questions can also misdirect you because they rely on superficial markers of credibility and authority. For example, some .org websites may be reliable and nonpartisan, while others may be partisan political action groups or even promoters of widely debunked conspiracy theories. On the other hand, some of the most authoritative news websites are .coms with advertisements, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Relying on superficial markers to evaluate credibility can be problematic because most websites won't say, I was designed by a biased political organization with an intent to manipulate you, or I'm leaving out important information that might give you a more objective perspective on this issue, or I was written by an uninformed person with no relevant expertise. So how do we improve our ability to evaluate websites when we know that some individuals and organizations may be working hard to misrepresent themselves and misinform us by using a skill called lateral reading? Lateral reading is a simple concept used by professional fact checkers and other savvy thinkers to judge the credibility of unfamiliar sources. While many of us judge a website by reading vertically, scrolling up and down to look for markers of credibility, or perhaps clicking on links within the site, fact checkers jump outside the site, using new browser tabs to seek additional information about the site's credibility, reputation, funding sources, and potential biases. In other words, fact checkers read laterally or horizontally across multiple web pages to get a big picture view of the site they're evaluating. They use Wikipedia, credible news sources, and other references on the web to understand what a source is and how credible it might be. They don't just take the source's word for it. For example, this news story on heavy metal music fan culture is on fizz.org, a website that may be unfamiliar to us. But if I open up a new tab, I can search for information about fizz.org and find out that it's a news aggregator that often republishes science news from across the web. 
I can also verify that the research discussed in the news story originated from University College London and PhD anthropology student Lindsay Bishop. By doing some homework on the source through lateral reading, we get a much better sense of what this source is and its level of credibility. We can also begin to think about its strengths and limitations from a more informed point of view. In this case, we might decide the information is reliable and a good starting point, but we might also want to look beyond this brief news story and find the original research or other more in-depth scholarly information. With lateral reading, you can move beyond the superficial aspects of website evaluation and develop a more nuanced and more complete perspective on the credibility of your sources. Reading laterally includes fact-checking. There are websites that just exist just to check facts. Here are a few very reputable fact-checking sites, factcheck.org, um, PolitiFact, the Washington Post Fact Checker, and Snopes. They are all transparent in their process for how they investigate claims and come to decisions about whether a claim is true, partially true, or false. You could go to any of these fact-checking sites and feel confident that they are diligent in their process. I'm going to go to factcheck.org and we'll just leave the screen again briefly. So this is factcheck.org, and they have on their page um, current um, claims that they've been investigating, um, some with their findings. And um, the main thing I want to show you is that they have an about us, um, and it's good to see what they tell us about their process for fact checking. They first they tell us what topics they include. Um, what topics they will fact check um, against. And then they have their selection methods for what they choose to actually fact check. Um, and then the research process and editing, et cetera. So um, this is uh, a good thing to take a look at, to understand how this fact checking website operates. And then you could also look at others. It's a project of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. Um, so it is um, not a um, commercial uh, site and it is focused on politics. I'm gonna go back now to um, PowerPoint. So, I highly recommend this book. Um, it's a free ebook by Mike Caulfield. And he has, um, since he published this, he's also created some additional projects, which if you Google Mike Caulfield and web literacy, you'll get to those as well. But this is linked from the library's LibGuide. Um, so I'm gonna show you that at the end of, the, of this presentation. And this book really is a handbook. You can use it to, um, understand lateral more about lateral reading. Um, he includes uh, ways to do fact checking yourself. And um, I'm going to just uh, let's see here. You know, I'll show it to you at the end, but it is linked from our um, Lib Library research guides, and it's a very um, useful tool. It, it includes a lot of strategies, and so it's a very practical resource. So now we're going to talk about images. Even if an image is not manipulated, it can be presented with a false context or incorrect caption, which makes it misleading. We need to determine if a caption describes an image accurately. Uh, because images with false context are easy to share and reshare on social media, they are a common source of misinformation. We have an easy example of deconstructing an image-based rumor here from the SIFT, uh, which is a newsletter from the News Literacy Project. We're going to take a look at it. 
So on Friday, October 16th, 2020, President Donald Trump held a campaign rally in Ocala, Florida. Later that day, someone posted a photo of a large crowd to Facebook and claimed it was the Ocala rally. But was it? Let's find out. Um, so you can view this post on Facebook here and it's archived here. But th this is a tweet that's been inserted into this. Um, this is an image, excuse me. No, th this is image that is a screenshot of a photo originally shared on Twitter. And also note that it's been flagged by one of Facebook's fact-checking partners. So this circle here is saying that the fact book, um, Facebook fact-checker partner has flagged this as um, being a problem. Uh, so we could click here and understand immediately why this was a problem, but let's see if we can solve this another way. So all of the following uh, methods would be potentially helpful for uh, helpful steps for checking out this example, but which two steps are more likely to help you find the provenance or origin of this photo? So these are our choices and the correct answers are check the comments on the Facebook post for clues and do a reverse image search on the photo. This is to get to the origin of the photo. Um, so while doing a quick web search is often the best first step you can take to check out information online. In this case, a text-based search about the rally is not likely to help you find information about this photo. Um, uh, looking at uh, Ocala, Florida from above in Google Maps might help you confirm whether the city has a body of water or a bridge that matches the photo, but it can help you determine the provenance of the photo if it's not Ocala. So there were some uh, comments here um, by uh, those in the Facebook po um, postings. And so one was somebody saying, this picture was taken in Zurich in 2018 uh, during the uh, street parade. And another person said, this doesn't look like the Ocala I have been to. I, I don't remember this old um, European construction. So we're getting some comments that are questioning that this is Ocala, Florida. So these were the trends. Claims of the photo is a uh, festival in Zurich, Switzerland. People pointing out the Western European architecture. There's not a body of water or bridge that looks like that. So we're gonna actually go to the Reuters fact check, which was what was circled here, to see what they said about the origin of this photo. So this is Reuters news service and they um, investigated the photo. This is Reuters staff. And it, their, their verdict, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom here, they're talking about their process for investigating it, which would be instructive if you're interested to see how they did that. And then the verdict was that th this, was, this was a false uh, attribution. The photo shows a 2019 music festival in Zurich, not Trump's recent rally in Ocala, Florida. And so it's, in the, they, it's, it's from the Reuters fact check team, that verdict. Um, so there are ways to get to, to trace things. Um, doing a reverse photo um, search would also be useful. Um, so memes are another um, you know, common, commonly shared type of information, and memes require a different strat, a different strategy. Um, it, it has one or two pictures usually, and a little bit of text, um, so not much context for the pictures that you're seeing. And so the you you need to um, get contextualization um, in order to understand what they are trying to imply. 
And I can't go into this topic in great detail, but I wanted to let you know that there are specific strategies um, for specific types of content, such as memes and miscaptioned or out of context images. And these are just some questions you can ask. What is the point it is trying to make? Is it factually correct? Is anything mischaracterized with generalizations, hyperbole or exaggeration? Unfairness, uh, what other facts and context are missing? So those are um, questions you can ask. And there is a site that is um, helpful, sort of uh, an outside of the meme site that is Know Your Meme. And um, I'm gonna go to this, uh, the Know Your Meme page about the uh, Ghost of Kiev uh, meme, which um, was shared during the, uh, early in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I'm gonna go to that uh, Know Your Meme site and see what they say about um, the Ghost of Kiev. And, so this um, is the Ghost of Kiev, uh, Know Your Meme. We're on the Know Your Meme site, which is an outside sort of evaluation site for memes. And there are lots of ads in, on this, unfortunately. But anyway, as we scroll down, it gives us background about the Ghost of Kiev um, meme. It um, shows images with, um, that were included. It talks about the spread of that meme, um, the developments, and the how it, they revealed how the um, false the falseness of the claim was revealed. So it's a it's an outside evaluative source, um, and so you might want to try knowyourmeme.com when you're trying to understand um, a meme that you're seeing. Okay, so unfortunately, we now also may encounter sophisticated disinformation in the form of manipulated media. And Reuters has um, teamed up with Facebook to create a free course on identifying and ta tackling manipulated media. Um, so this is the, the booklet that they created. And um, this is um, the beginning of the course, is the, the outline for the course. How can it, how can media be manipulated? The new threat of deep fake and synthetic media, and what can newsrooms do to tackle mani manipulated media? And here's an example from this course. These are not images of real models, they are artificial faces that have been generated using deep learning technology. Um, it is the work of a company called Generated Photos. And deep fakes can be used to create false identities. Um, so Reuters has also um, included uh, how to um, identify fake videos as well as photos. And so that um, uh, source is excellent. I'm gonna now move on to the last sort of area we're gonna look at today, which is um, conspiracy theories, and it's a tricky type of disinformation. So this tool was presented by Vanessa Otero at a media literacy workshop on conspiracy theories and memes. And these are indicators, eight indicators red, um, with red flags in uh, that red, red flags rhetoric common to conspiracy theories. I'm just gonna quickly read the um, red flag. So conspiracy theory, it explicitly states that it is telling the truth uh, and, and or everyone else is lying to you. Uh, it contains a short conclusory opinion statement or statements. It is organized as a list of questions or hypotheses instead of pro providing you with information. It puts the burden on you to answer the questions. It asks you to provide a negative, which is often impossible. You no, know, no one has proven that the government wasn't involved. Um, six, it suggests an insidious plot by someone 
media elites, corporations, government, but doesn't say exactly what the plot is or provide any evidence for it. Uh, elevates the credibility of one expert who goes against the consensus of their entire expert peer group. For example, one scientist versus all the other scientists, which uh, you know points to why it's so important to get multiple um, sources of information when you're trying to get to the truth. Claims that being taken down for promoting misinformation is censorship, which therefore proves that the item taken down is actually true. So uh, that's a big one. So those are just some um, features of, um, of conspiracy theory techniques. So the library has collections of news sources in our databases. And um, I'm gonna show you that at the end, but I want to um, point out that there is a game um, called Fake Out, which, which is from Mike Caulfield, the same author who wrote the Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers book. And this game um, is, you know, I would, if I, you know, let me show you what it looks like here. Um, I recommend that you try this, uh, not, not during this workshop because we're, we don't have time to really, for you to really get into this game. But um, it looks like this when you go to the website, uh, newsliteracy.ca. Let me um, paste this into the chat. Um, so I can do that. Um, so this game, the best way to approach it, it's asking you to look at um, some news uh, headlines with images and then asking you whether you think it's true or false. Um, and if you're just going on your own knowledge, it's pretty tough to you know, guess what's right because that's really what you're doing is guessing. You may have an intuition, but the, the method that works the best, since they do provide, they have a series, I think it's about 10 different stories and they um, do provide the source of the information. And um, so you could learn more about that source by doing lateral reading. And so that's how I suggest you approach this game. Um, maybe you just because you can then see how it might, the result might differ from your guessing about whether that was a true or false story. You can learn a lot about um, the story by going outside of this game, doing lateral reading on the source or the headline, and then, then arriving at your conclusion. So um, this, by the way, this um, workshop is re being recorded and it's going to be posted on our website um, along with all of our past videos on our YouTube channel. Um, and so you can, if you don't get this link from the chat box now, you will still be able to get back to this whole workshop and this will, information will be repeated there. So it's a good way to test your knowledge and learn lateral reading, practice lateral reading. So the um, workshop is wrapping up. I am going to show you. Um, the uh, fake news and disinformation research guide on our library page uh, momentarily. Um, but I do want to give you this information in case you're watching this workshop because your professor has told you you would um, get extra credit for attending. And so the code phrase for this workshop is won't get fooled again. Um, and so I'll give you a moment to write that down. Um, maybe I'll, no, I'm not going to put it in the chat. I'm just going to let you uh, write that down um, so you can use it if you need it for extra credit. Won't get fooled again. Okay, so um, 
Let's see. This is we have this uh, chart as part of our libguide. So I think what I'll do is um, take us to the college website. I'm going to go to the library page um, under student support. I'm going to click on research guides. And I'm going to click on all guides. So I'm looking at an alphabetical list of these are sort of uh, pathfinders for different topic areas. And I'm clicking on F fake news and disinformation. So it's listed under F for fake. Um, and I select that scroll down and um, what I wanted to show you was the um, find news articles in SMC library. This is going to link you directly to um, databases that you have access to because you're currently a part of SMC. You just have to log in initially with your SMC credentials um, and then you can access um, these databases. So um, the you know, major national newspapers are found in the US news stream. So some of these are the papers that we were seeing, for example, on the All Sides website, um, although they may be the web version. And these include blogs and et cetera, but they also include the text of the newspaper itself. And you have multiple choices here. So just wanted you to see this link is here with all of these different um, sources for news, which you could then you know, check by reading laterally to see what is said about these publications if you're not sure you trust them. Um, we have them because they go through a process of strict um, and you know, uh, quality assurance. So that's something that we, we feel confident in linking to them. But individual stories, you might have to judge on a you know, case by case basis. And so I'm gonna let you follow up on that. Um, and then the other thing was the Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers book is here on this page. And if I choose that and I go to read the book, I can look at the table of contents and I can get you know, a, a sense and just click in here and learn about how to, you know, um, use tools and how to think about um, information as you encounter it. It's a really excellent site. And it's now 1230. So we're out of time. Um, and I could, let me just see if there's anything else. Um, I would point out to one other thing. I have links to fact-checking sites, the ones that we looked at on that slide, um, and then also news literacy projects um, that repeat a lot of what we have been looking at. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to uh, encourage you to look at is this news literacy project, because they have um, a section with quizzes so if you liked um, the if you like that fake fake out game, you like that kind of interactive um, learning method. It's I found it to be helpful. I I looked at the um, um, quiz on um, on conspiratorial thinking, and that was really interesting. And they have different topics like um, confirmation bias. A news lit quiz, should you share it? So, and so this again is linked from our, um, oops, sorry, our uh, research guide on the library website on fake news and disinformation. So, um, are there any questions before I wrap it up? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I hope this helps. It really should serve. Oh, um, it really, uh, let's see. Okay, who can, uh, okay, thank you. All right, um, I see, see your response there. Um, so uh, it's really designed as an introduction and 
the librarians here are, are happy to help you and to understand anything um, from this workshop or to help you in evaluating sources and just learning to navigate information in its various forms. And so thank you so much for coming and I hope this has helped. And have a great day, everyone. I think I'll stop sharing now um, since I don't see any questions. So thank you and have a great day. Bye bye. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for coming.